out of all the mistakes we've been talking about for the last hour, the worst mistake that somebody can make is... Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Playing With Power podcast, the podcast where we talk about all things CEDH, EDH, and Magic the Gathering. I am your host, Ryan. And I am your host, Callahan. And today, we are going to be talking about common mistakes new CEDH players make. We will discuss some things we've seen out in the wild, as well as some of our own personal experiences to help you avoid some of these pitfalls. But first, we're going to pay the bills. So first up, our merchandise is now available in our store. We have dice, coins, playmats, tokens, sleeves, and more all available. Go to playingwithpowermtg.com to help support our channel. And talking about how you can support our channel, you can also support us on Patreon. Uh, we recently reworked it. Patrons get access to our Discord, Webcam League, Play Days, early access to videos, names in the credits of our shows. Uh, we even have exclusive videos, merchandise, and the ability to be on an episode on some of our higher tiers. Uh, there are tiers available for everyone, so go to patreon.com slash paying and help support the show. And speaking of Patreons, we always do a Patreon shout out at the beginning of every episode. And today's Patreon shout out is Soiled Hobbit. Thank you very much for your support. support hey, thanks, Soiled, Soiled Hobbit. Hobbit. Um, maybe get a new screen name. That's a little, yeah, just, that's a little, just, that's a little concerning. Uh, that's okay. We'll just, you know, teach their own. Okay. All right. So let's dive right into our main topic, which is common mistakes uh, that CEDH players make or new CEDH players make. You're getting into the format. You're seeing what this crazy thing is. You were told about it. You saw it online or you just wanted to dip your toes in. And so you decided to just jump in or dip your toes in and wanted to see what it's like. And a lot of these, what we're going to be going over today are just common mistakes. Not only did we see out in the wild when we were playing with other people, but some of these are some of the mistakes we made ourselves. And we wish someone had told us this ahead of time. It would have saved us a lot of time, hassle, money in some cases. And so we're going to go over each of these today, and hopefully this will help some people out there. So I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. I'm going to start off with uh first one, which is not coming prepared to play at a CEDH table. So what does that mean? Callahan, kick us off. What does that mean when we say we're not coming prepared? Yeah, so uh, we have quite a few things here that that could mean. But um, I think, the, you know, this is a big mistake that people make because they hear about CDH. I think a lot of people kind of have this image of what CDH is in their head, but it might not uh, be fully informed. So, you know, they come to a CDH table and they might have a deck that just, you know, might automatically lose them the game. Um, it just, you know, and that's that's a feels bad because... Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about what CDH is. So, you know, you sit down at a CDH table, you think you have a, a CDH level deck and uh, you might just be wrong. Yeah. Bringing your high powered deck because you guys had an arms race at your casual pod and all of your casual friends told you that's a CDH deck that doesn't belong here. And then you bring your high powered deck because everyone told you it was a CDH deck and you just got completely annihilated at the CDH tables, it leaves you feeling a little disjointed or discontented. You're like, wait a minute, so this doesn't belong here, but this doesn't belong there either. I'm not really sure where I kind of fit into this whole thing. And that's that can be kind of, like I said, a little jarring. You're like, well, I was told this was CDH. Well, you're probably told that was CDH from non-CEDH players. And not to put that into like an exclusive club or anything like that. And I don't want to have that to be a negative connotation, but that is something that happens a lot of times. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think, I think part, part of the issue here is that, you know, what a CEDH deck is and isn't can be kind of hard to define. You know, a lot of people will see uh free mana and like, you know, mana crypt, uh, mana vault, not free, but fast soul ring. Obviously we all play that already, you know, but you know, Mox Opal, Mox Diamond, you know, maybe we're playing that and, you know, you have a fierce guardianship in your deck and you're like, all right, I've got the free interaction. I've got the, the fast mana. I'm playing CDH. Well, maybe, but, um, there's, you know, there's kind of another level that you have to get above, above that point to like really hang at a lot of tables, you know, your commander, probably has to meaningfully uh, add to your plan. You know, you got to make sure your commander is really doing something for you. You got to make sure you can uh, adequately win the game, you know, unless you're a really fast elf ball deck, like uh, a CDH Marwin or something, 
trying to build up a, a, a board state of creatures and then like crater hoof people probably won't get there in time. But that's that's kind of a hard line to find. So I think that's a, a big a big problem that people run into when it comes to like not coming to prepare to play at a CDH table. It's just like, all right, I've got the free interaction. I've got the free mana. Uh, do I have too many pet cards in here or what? You know? Yeah, I agree. And things that frequently happen along those lines is you're playing with these high powered decks and you're coming to a CDH table. And then, like I said, you get annihilated or you just get stomped and you're like, well, I thought this was a CDH deck and CDH isn't just a list of cards. You know, there's, there's so much more to that and having CDH be just defined, like you said, which outsiders usually looking in define as, well, you've got all the fast mana and you got all the free interaction. It looks like you're running Thoracle. And so you obviously are running a CDH deck that doesn't belong at the casual tables. Well, it sounds like a pretty close to CDH deck for me, Ryan. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> the moment I said Thoracle, everything hey, became hey. CDH. <laughs> yes, but that's the thing. There's so much more to CDH than that. And that I really don't want that to come off as elitist. We want everybody to play this format. We want everyone to have a good time. So let's create a quick parallel. Let's say that you were given, you were gifted a box of bulk rare, uh, bulk uh, commons, uncommons, and rares that somebody who was just trying to unload some stuff wanted you to get into magic gave you. It's a shoebox full. And you threw those together and you had 20 lands and you went to go to you know, legacy night at your local LGS. It's kind of similar to that. Just because you have cards that are legal in this format does not automatically mean that it's a CDH deck. Just like, because in casual commander, we have things like power levels and stuff like that, where you can just put a hundred cards together. And so long as it's a hundred cards, you have a commander and it's your color identity, you technically have a commander deck. But you also can't bring your draft chaff to the high powered tables either. And this is something very similar to that. Yep, certainly, certainly. And like move it, move it on past the deck a little bit, you know. So that's that's definitely a, a, a way you can mess up. Just like bring the wrong deck to the table. You'll probably be in for a bad time because somebody will Thoracle combo you on turn three and you'll be like, oh, this stinks. Well, your deck maybe just wasn't ready. But that's that's another another thing that's like maybe can only be gained with experience um can be partially learned by reading up as much as possible online and stuff but you you'll probably have a little bit of a bad time too if you if you're not at least somewhat up to date on like strategies popular decks and like the win cons you can expect people to play because a big part of cdh is being able to uh, play your part at the table correctly um uh you know, have interaction at the right time to stop uh, what you presume will be a win con from somebody. Uh, just having the baseline knowledge of what other people's decks are trying to do too can be a huge boon. So if you're before you sit down at your first CDH day, well, you know, if you're able to do some reading about the format, if you're able to watch some videos and stuff, that would probably help you be a lot more prepared out of the gate too. Yeah, and we're definitely not saying that you should go and do, you know, 100 hours of study just to, before you play your first game, because definitely playing games is a way to get into this format and understanding it more. But knowing just at least at a baseline certain things, when you're sitting across from a Tim Nathrasios player, uh, or you're sitting across from a Malcolm Tana player, or a Goto player, or a, just any of these different decks, you having at least a baseline of understanding of what they're trying to do will help you better understand uh, how to play against that deck. I'm not saying you have to go in deep and read the primer on 150 decks in order to, before you even start your first game, but just understanding, oh, looks like we have a Malcolm player that has red in the color identity too, probably dealing with the Malcolm Glinthorn thing. What is the Malcolm Glinthorn thing? Go check out Better Know a Combo by the Spike Beaters, and you'll be able to figure that out in less than five minutes how that combo works and when and how to stop that combo. Because doing that will allow you to say, okay, well, this is the piece of interaction in my hand at this given point in time. They might be going for Malcolm Glenhorn turn two, turn three. This is how I'm going to stop it. I have a source of plowshares, or maybe I have stack interaction, like a you know, like a counter spell. Well, I'll do this or I'll do that. And those are the types of things that we're talking about when we say, you know, know what the strategy is or the deck is or the win con is. And that will help you kind of get a springboard versus having to learn by losing over and over, which is very discouraging at times. 
Certainly. And I think I think this transitions us into our next kind of big overall section here um, where, you know, a common mistake that a lot of CD, new CDH players make accidentally is just like using their interaction at a bad time. You know, they have poor threat assessment um, or maybe they have bad timing for their threat assessment. Um, the, the biggest way that I so often see this, I mean, I do it myself too, but it's just wasting your removal or your counter magic. Um, your removal and your counter magic is at such a premium in CDH because you have three opponents that you're responsible for dealing with. They're all trying to impact the game in a very strong way. And so, you know, if you fire off a, a path to exile on, I don't know, a Timna, uh, you know, good card. It's not going to win the game. It's drawn a lot of cards. It's not actually a creature that's winning the game right now. You know, uh, waste a counter spell on insert random value piece here. Sure, you should probably counter a Rhystic Study. Maybe you shouldn't counter, I don't know, a Sylvan Library, you know? Uh, so there's there's some differences here. There's pieces that are good enough to remove. There's pieces that aren't good enough to remove. You only have so much removal in your deck. You got to be careful with it. Yeah. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of times when people bring that casual mindset over to the CDH tables and they're like, well, you know, I have one open and it's my instep. I'll just exile. I'll just path to exile your commander or I'll just path to exile your dork or something like that because, you know, I don't want to waste it, you know, and, and it's rotting away in my hand. So I want to use it. That's the wrong mindset to have. You don't want to waste your interaction, especially when there's ki uh, pivotal and key moments when it is absolutely going to mean the difference between you winning and losing that game. And wasting your removal in ways like that is going to not only make it so that you don't win that game, but you're going to frustrate a lot of the other people at the table because they're like, I don't have anything. I'm tapped out. They, they went off a lot earlier than expected. You have one wide open. Why did you burn that on their, you know, why'd you burn that on their, their dork when they're now have Glenhorn out and now we're just dead. You know, why did you do that? So you're going to frustrate some people at the table. Not to say that you can't make mistakes because that happens as part of learning. Yeah, we all but, certainly make a lot of mistakes. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I, the reason I keep bringing up Glenhorn is actually because this was one of those key moments that actually had us put this in the notes. Uh, I, when we first saw Malcolm come out, we started to get into the pandemic. and we The, the malcolm Glenhorn combo started to emerge. This was after Commander Legends a couple of years ago. And we were playing webcam magic and the person's webcam that we were playing against was not the best quality. Let's just say that a little fuzzy, a little on the fuzzy side. And I said, I said, OK, uh, yeah, Malcolm Glenhorn, I know that's a combo or whatever. And he was like, OK, can I can I move to combat? And I said, uh, yeah, I guess yeah, you got I, it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I'm going to hit you before you make the treasures. And. I didn't read that the card said only when it's attacking. So if I had done that before combat, the combo never would have went off and we would have been alive. Well, I didn't know what the card did. Yep. And, you know, and that was a learning moment for me. And that's part of the reason why I bring that stuff up. You knowing these things are help are going to help you get better. And it's nice to not have to fumble over and lose a game to have to do that. And that's just and knowing these things will help you springboard. Yeah, exactly. And like some of that stuff kind of just has to be learned by experience sometimes and it'll feel bad like you, you know, learning that with Glinthorn. Uh the way the Glinthorn Malcolm combo works is kind of surprisingly a little bit non-intuitive. You know, if you if you don't sit down and you read both of the cards and you kind of realize exactly how it works. There's a better Noah combo video for this, by the way, narrated by yourself, uh by myself truly. Um brought to but, you by the spike feeders. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um you know, if you if you don't know exactly how that works, yeah, you'll you'll probably lose to it sometimes, and then you'll probably never lose to it again that way. Because that's that's a great way to learn a lesson the hard way, right? Uh, <laughs> you'll never you, see you still remember that Glinthorn combo probably got you two years ago, and you're still like, I remember the first it, time when I accidentally lost to Glinthorn. It is etched into my mind forever. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and, and much in the same way, uh, uh, nothing quite sticks with me like when I accidentally like try to win the game too early and just get blown out. That's another instance of bad timing that you do maybe have to kind of learn. It comes with experience in the format, but it can lead to some pretty bad blowouts for newer CDH players. Um, earlier in the podcast a few minutes ago, I mentioned uh, the idea of kind of knowing your seat at the table, kind of working within the texture of the table. 
you know, in a lot of tables, the first player gets to try to win first. That's kind of how it goes. They have more resources than anyone else, usually most of the time. Uh, and then the other players have to stop them. And if they don't have it, then the first player wins. That's not how it always goes. That's often how it goes. Um, so, But if you're in the fourth seat, you maybe shouldn't keep a super duper greedy hand that tries to win on turn three. Because if you do that, you might just lose the game on turn one or two or three to the first or second player. Um, and if and you're in a longer game where everyone's just building up resources for a long time and stuff, maybe just don't try to jam a win without backup because everyone has three free counter spells stocked up in their hand waiting for somebody to do exactly what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> it's it. And that's the thing. It's like, well, gosh, this is new CDH player tips. Good Lord. I'm totally not equipped for this format. No, that's not the case. What we're trying to say is, you know, there are times when you have to read the table and this happens at every game of Magic, not every CDH game, not every Commander game, every single game of Magic. You have to read the table. And casual Commander players kind of get into a laissez-faire mindset where they're just like, you know, I'm just playing my cards. We're just having a good time. It's fine. You know, no big deal. And they're not reading the table, like you said, maybe position at the table and things like that. And you're... Just finding yourself in a situation, you're like, yeah, I could totally go for it thir turn three. And you're seeing that everyone's holding up two blue or white or whatever. And you're going to try and jam your goto. And you're like, oh, I can't believe I got blown out. You're like, well, of course you got blown out. Nobody did anything for three turns. And you just went for it. Like they were waiting for you to go off. So, you know, reading that table, understanding what's going on and saying they're probably going to interact with me and then try and go off once they've dealt with me per se now they can go ahead and develop their game you have to be aware of those types of things you're going to lose a lot more games by you know trying to jam it too early and on that uh and on that note there's also the opposite of that waiting way too long to uh go for it yeah certainly there's in pretty much every single game of cdh if, you know, you get past the the first little fluky one, two, three type of wins where somebody just has it and nobody else has the answer for it, it, it there's like windows of opportunity that will open up for you. Uh, somebody else will have tried to win. There'll be a counter war. You know your opponent's shields are down and you have it. You know, that's, that's your moment to jam it. Um, there'll be other times where... Uh, you've noticed that, you know, kind of had some back and forth. It might not be as dramatic as a moment of somebody going for the Adnaz win. And then there's, oh, there's two and three, four counter spells exchanged back and forth between the other three players. And you're sitting there pretty with your perfect combo win in hand with backup. You know, maybe you've just been paying attention. And you're like, oh, that Rhystic study got countered by that player. And that Mystic Remora got countered. And that good creature got removed. And this person used the silence to stop that other person. So I think... I think this is my chance to go for it because I've got this I've got this fierce guardianship in hand to counter, you know, one other piece of interaction. You know, I think this is my window. And if and if you can suss out those things and you can, like, find those windows, you got to own it when you can, because if you think you have a window open and you say, uh, I'm going to wait another turn, then the person after you who's also noticed these things might decide it's their window to go for it. Or they might resolve a value piece that lets them draw another two or three cards before it's your turn again or whatever. You know, the, the shape of the table changes so dramatically every turn. If you think you've got the window, you might just have to take it or else you'll have missed it and your chances to win the game just evaporate. This is not a format that has 10 turns. You know, this is a format that has four on average and you don't exactly always have a lot of windows and there's going to be times when you're going to take a risk uh that's part of the fun of it you're like well they're holding up two blue but they might be bluffing they're a control player or whatever or maybe they're more reactive and they're just hoping that i'm i get scared out of going for it and so I'm just going to risk it and hope that it gets there. And as it turns out, there's plenty of times where they just were bluffing or you're playing a creature combo and all they had was a dispel in their hand and you just get to win. And so it's about timing your it's about timing when you're supposed to go for it. And that's not always clear. Some of that will come with time. Some of that you'll make through a couple of blunders, but just start to pay attention to that stuff. Oh, wow. Just like you said. 
big ad nauseum stack and all this other stuff was going on. And, and now they have to pass a turn because I just, they got blown out with a silence. Oh, that's perfect. Now everyone's silenced out and now I can just try and go for it. And sometimes it's just about those windows or sometimes it's about taking a risk in those windows. Cause you're like, I know if it gets to the player behind me, this game is over. I know it is. Yeah, so I've got exactly. to try. Like that's exactly how I got one of my wins at, a, at the last tournament we I was at Silicon Dynasty. I saw the little tiniest window, the blue farm player who we all knew was going to win if they untapped, tapped out on the end of the person's turn before them to cast Vampiric Tutor. And I said, you know what? I'm going to respond by casting Final Fortune. You know, that's like all in as you can get. Final Fortune, red, red, instant, take an extra turn after this one. At the end of that turn, you lose the game. So it's just like I said, all right. This is my window. If I don't win in this extra turn that I'm stealing out of turn order, uh, I'll, I'll lose the game. And I said, all right, this is my window. And then I won the game because I was able to say, oh, I'm just going to I'm going to try to win instead. And so I was able to get there. But you just have to you have to find those little gaps. You have to find those little windows and just uh, jam. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I finally I, I, I frequently see and. Like if this happens to you, by the way, do not be do not feel sad because this happens to experienced players all the time. And that is removing your stacks pieces at the wrong time. If there is a Draneth Magistrate shutting you down, there is a really good chance that Draneth Magistrate is shutting other people down, too. So do not burn your sorcery speed removal on it and pass the turn. Do if not you're do not that. just like winning the game. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're yeah, doing, yeah, 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 evoke fury, get rid of Draneth, then win. Okay, you've got it. You know, use your shatter skull smashing, then win the game. But before that happens, if you do it on the end of someone else's turn because they're oh oh they they cast a mystic remore. Oh no, I better remove that Draneth now with my instant speed removal so they don't draw a card. Whoops! You just let the next person in turn order before you now get a chance to do stuff with that Draneth and maybe they execute an Underworld Breach combo or maybe they use their commanders to just go off and win. You have to do this at the right time. You, It's frequently very easy to get tunnel vision when it comes to stacks pieces. Oh, this Collector Oof or this Draneth Magistrate or this Thalia is just shutting me down so hard. I want to remove it so badly. It might be shutting other people down just as badly as you. Yeah, certainly. And I think this is definitely one of the hardest things about stacks pieces is they do make the game so difficult in that way. You know, you're stuck under a rule of law. You really have like you really just want to get out from under it and you think you can win. Well, even if you could like try to win the game, if you remove the rule of law. Remember, we've been playing under a rule of law for the last four turns. Your opponents haven't done anything either. You're going to remove a rule of law. They're going to say, oh, yeah, great job. And they're going to try to win. And then they're going to be like, here's my six counter spells that I've been holding because I can't counter anything under a rule of law. And they're going to be yep. like, oh no. And then they're going to untap and win the game because you remove the rule of law. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, it's yeah. so true. Yep. So that's, that's definitely a major thing you have to look out for. Uh, same thing, you know, bad timing, poor threat assessment. You just got to watch out for those stacks pieces. Collector Oof is sad. The Malcolm player is more sad than you are. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Trust me when we say the only person who doesn't want that stacks piece removed is the person playing the stacks piece. So there's a lot of times when you don't even have to be the one to remove it. And that's a good thing, too. And that comes into the last topic of the threat assessment and bad timing thing. And that is respecting priority. Tell us what priority is, Cal. So, you know, every single time there's uh, uh, every single time there's a thing placed onto the stack, it could be an activated ability. It could be a triggered ability. It could be a spell. There's a round of priority where in a turd order, after whoever placed the object onto the stack, each person has a chance to do an instant speed action, such as activating their own activated ability or casting an instant speed spell. And that is the kicker. You go in turn order. Don't jump priority. If you, as the fourth player, are uh, desperately wanting to counter something from the first player, don't hop in as soon as they cast it and say, I counter that, uh, because you just wasted an opportunity to get a counter spell out of the second or third player's hand. 
you know? So every every single time priority goes around, just make sure, don't make the mistake of hopping in line. Let the second player say, oh, hum, 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 should I counter this with this counter spell? I'm now letting you know that I have in my hand, or I'm thinking mm-hmm. about, but you know. Uh, I'll pass to the third player, and the third player says, I've got nothing, I pass to you. And then you can counter it. But if you... If you just immediately jump the line, you've missed the opportunity of the third player going, ugh, I can't pass to the fourth player. They've already countered two spells this game. I bet they're out of action. I guess I have to counter this now. And then you're still up a counter spell. Yep. And that's the key, is you are not responsible for everything at the table. This is a four-player game, not a two-player game. So if there's a collector oof shutting you down, there's a really good chance a collector oof is shutting other people down too, and they want to remove it just as bad as you. So sometimes it's better to wait till they remove it and then stop what that player's going to do, depending on what your turn order is, before you could do it. But you can't do that if you keep jumping priority. So if you are jumping priority, just like Cal said, you are creating a situation where you don't have the interaction you need once that stacks piece is removed or whatever that other problem is or or you you know the game winning spell whatever it might be having that and jumping priority every time is just going to be you burning through all of your interaction and not saving any for when you're actually trying to go off yourself you're policing the table and it's not necessarily your job to police that table so respect priority and understand those cues I'm not saying you have to understand those cues immediately, but just pay a little bit more attention to priority. When you sit down at a CDH game, you will notice very frequently people say, cast Mox Opal, and then they pause. And that's because they're waiting for everyone to say, pass priority. Even though I've never seen a Mox Opal countered in the history of CDH, ever. But they still respect that priority because this is what you do with everything because priority is so much more important inside of a four-player game. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And I think that's that, you know, that waiting after and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of a part of a larger mindset that you bring to a CDH game. And I think it kind of brings us a little bit into our next large overarching section. You know, a big common group of mistakes that newer CDH players can make is bringing more of that casual mindset to the table. Um, you know, this is kind of a hard thing to discuss because a lot of times when CEDH played is played, it is kind of casual, you know, same kind of environment as casual EDH is played in, you know, we're hanging out with our friends. We just happen to be jamming a lot more powerful types of magic, right? But there is kind of some type of things to keep in mind when you're playing CEDH that a lot of people like to try to do, you know, uh, I think the main center of the mindset is that like, you know, we're all here to win. We're all doing things to win and you know try to not not do that <laughs> well spoken poet cow <laughs> i'm a I'm, I'm a i'm a writer i'm not a speaker sue me <laughs> try, try to not not do that my friends <laughs> but yeah so some com- some common things that happen when coming over to CDH is that you still kind of bring a casual mindset to the table. And when I say casual, I say more of like the casual commander side of the table, because that's where a lot of people come from. They, you know, they have the arms race and they get a high power or they watch a video and they play casual commander and they see the CDH stuff going on. They're like, wow, I really want to play that. And then you sit down at the table and then you start to do things like, well, I'll roll the dice to see who I'm going to attack or, oh, you know, ah, you know, I, I want to remove that. Sorry for doing that. Sorry. You shrug your shoulders and and you saying things like that. And that stuff is, is the thing is with CDH, you don't really have to do that stuff. You can always just attack one player over and over. They're not going to take it personally. Um, it, you know, you don't have to say, well, I'm going to let the dice decide so no one gets mad at me. Or, you know, oh, I apologize for removing your... No, you don't need to say you're sorry. You don't need to apologize for your behavior. Everyone comes in of CDH with the mindset that you're trying to win. Casual Commander is very unique in the fact of magic that it doesn't always have that mindset. But CEDH does have that mindset. So you don't need to apologize for your behavior. You don't need to do things to try and avoid any sort of bad feelings. There isn't salt at CDH games. 
And so you're okay to say, well, okay, all right, all right mate, there can uh, be salt, <laughs> but not because you you yes. know, were targeting yes, a player exactly. for attacking your team. Yes, exactly. You know? You're like, oh, you're attacking me, so you can draw with Timda. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm not taking that personally. I understand that was the right call to make. And I know it's not personal. I know you're not, you don't have a vendetta against me. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. And so those types of things you don't need to bring to a CDH table. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be, you know, downtrodden and hard nosed and, you know, poker face the entire time. Just like you said, Cal. Everything that we're doing, we're still having fun doing. We're just doing it with extremely powerful decks and cards. That's all we're doing. We're still laughing, cutting up, having a good time. But we're just doing it with really, really expensive and powerful cards. Exactly. And like, you know, we're cutting it up. We're having a good time. A lot of a lot of times when that happens in more casual EDH games, a lot of ways that can uh, materialize is like through deals and that kind of stuff or alliances. All right. You and I, we're going to ally against this guy and all that kind of stuff. And that does happen in CEDH a little bit, you know, but it's very in a lot of more casual EDH games. It's like a several turn proposition where we're going to figure out this complex deal between the two of us where I won't attack you and you won't attack me. And then I'll remove that thing if you do this kind of thing where in CEDH, the deals are a lot more. Uh, should I like resolve this wheel of fortune? If I resolve this wheel of fortune, will you promise me that you won't win on your turn? Because we all know that this guy has this spell in his hand that he can't get back from his graveyard, but it's going to win him the game. So what if we just like dumped it into the bin with this wheel of fortune? Is that okay with everybody? And then it's like very much that kind of one for one. You can talk a little bit, but people will usually tell you no anyway because they think you're trying to pull one over on them. So <laughs> you might have the to, dark side of politics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you might have to. You might have to. You're definitely going to have a lot less deal cutting and all that stuff than you're used to. There's still some, but people aren't going to try to ally up with you for a few turns. <laughs> and what I usually usually like to call it are thinly veiled threats. That's yeah, really sure. what a lot of deals in Casual Commander is. Hey. Uh, if you do this, uh, you can't attack me for three turns. I'm like, that's not a deal. That's a threat. Like, that's what that is. And so usually a lot of times, even in casual commander, I usually don't take any deals. Like, oh, if you if if you deal with that, I won't attack you and kill you. Be like, no, just kill me. And now you have to deal with it or keep me alive so you can stay alive. So they're, they're thinly veiled threats is really what they are. And CDH doesn't have those. Usually what CDH has is they say, whoa, wait, wait, wait. If you want me to deal with this, it has to be on the stack. Because the only thing I have in my hand is like, you know, stack interaction, not permanent interaction. They're like, oh, okay, well, you have a Mystic Remora. I'll have you draw a card. I'll, I'll, I'll fire off something and I'll have you draw like a brainstorm or something. And those are the types of deals maybe made in those particular circumstances. But they don't make those like crazy, you can't attack me for three turns, or I'll only do this if you do that kind of thing. And that's not to say that CDH doesn't have its, you know, uh, have its deals and stuff like that, yeah, but they're just does, so yeah. much more differently framed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, also still in that vein, um, the relationship between how you play the game and the players in CDH is, is quite a different, uh, quite a bit different. Now, the one thing that I really often hang on to is like in EDH games, there are very often, especially in consistent play groups, there's something that a lot of CDH players call like spite playing, which is very much like, Oh, you won last game. So I am going to kill you first this game type of uh, stuff, you know, uh, you spilled my drink at board game night last night. And now that we're playing EDH again, I'm going to hit you with this dude, or I'm going <laughs> to remove your thing, you know, kind of thing where very much like the real world is brought into the game. And that's, that's something that we would also recommend that you leave behind. Don't, don't make the mistake of trying to do that stuff because you're just going to tick people off. You know, we would prefer CDH players would usually prefer other CDH players to, you know, attack me because I'm playing ad nauseum. Don't, mm -hmm. and I need my life total to be lowered for your win percent uh, to go up. Don't attack me because I ate your snacks. I don't... <laughs> okay, I will attack you physically if you eat my <laughs> snacks, first of all. First of all, <laughs> don't ever eat my snacks. What's wrong with you? <laughs> 
Uh, but it's true. So things like spite plays and or game memory, as I usually like to call it. Oh, well, I'm going to attack you. Be like, what are you attacking me for? Because you won last game. Be like, what does that have to do with anything? The hands are different. The turn order is different. Everything's different. Sure, the deck's the same. But, you know, it, just because I beat you like that's that just feels like a very salty move. And you don't need to do that inside of CEDH. And and if I may recommend may make a recommendation, don't do that in anything. Don't do that in casual commander either. Quite frankly, it's it's not a good look. You know, it just it just looks like you're vindictive. It just looks like you hold a grudge. It's just a bad look all around. But there's spite playing and intentional keen making. You see this all the time in casual commander, or at least I've seen it in random pods whenever I played at conventions and I played casual. Oh, you're about to win. Oh, OK, well, I'm. I've, I've got to attack. OK, well, I got to go. So I'm going to overload Rift on the way out. Well, that's not cool. You know, uh, you know, doing certain things like that spite playing. Well, I'm going to I'm going to destroy your lands before you kill me uh, or something like or just something really, you know, vindictive or even petty, I would even call it. So don't do spite plays. Don't spite pact. That's the thing you hear a lot of times. That's spite pacting, which is casting a pact of negation when you know you can't pay for it. That's what you want to avoid. Uh, so you're like, oh, turn two, he's going for the win. I have a pact of negation. I'm going to pack that. And then you just lose the game on your upkeep. That's a spite play. There's no there's no advantage to you winning by casting that. You're just you're not going to win. You're actually going to throw the game because you're intentionally losing and that person didn't get to go off and then the next person does. That's spite playing. And then the other thing I would call is, is king making. Now, there is a lot of debate about king making. So before we do that, tell us what king making is, Cal. King making is a very uh, nebulous uh, situation in which you, as a player, pretty much have the decision to through like through your interaction or through your attacking or whatever, where your decision pretty much directly chooses who will win the game. Um, somebody's going off. You have the interaction, you know, the next person can win, you counter their thing. So like the next person wins, I'm always going to counter the thing because I think that ups my win percent. But, um, you know, it's this very nebulous topic that a lot of people talk about a lot, but the, the gist is king making is you make a choice with the direct knowledge that by making your choice, you're letting somebody else win the game that is not you. Is that a good enough definition? Is that, that is better a, than my last definition you had me give? <laughs> that was a great definition. It was a great definition. We have an entire podcast episode on king making, so definitely check that out. We'll have it in the show notes and maybe up in the corner, depending on the platform you're watching slash listening to this to. But uh, the thing that we usually say is that it's about intentional king making that we discourage. Well, you blew up my stacks piece, and so... I don't care if I don't win, so long as it's not you that wins. Because that's intentional king making. We don't want to do that. We won't we don't want to throw the game for one other person to intentionally make another person win to to get that other player, quote unquote. Um, there is plenty of times when you unintentionally king make, and that is a little bit more ambiguous, and that is a little bit more case by case. And it is in its very definition of unintentional king making, not something you're doing on purpose. So just be kind of aware that if there is a king making scenario going on, that try not to do it or, you know, try to avoid it to the best of your ability. But I personally agree with you, Cal. Like I if if there's a chance that that person is going to win and the very the person very uh, the, the the person next in turn order also has a win shown in hand. I'm still going to counter the first persons. I'm still going to do it. I don't care what they say. Oh, you're king making the next player. Be like, no, I'm playing you don't to know my house. I have in my hand. <laughs> yeah, you have no idea what else I have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm absolutely going to play to my house. I'm going to counter your stuff. I'm not king making you or the next person. So it's intentional king making that we want to avoid. Unintentional is by definition something that you can't always help. And that's just how it is. Yep, exactly. Um, moving on a little bit in the casual mindset stuff. Um, you know, a lot of people really like to have their own deck. Uh, it's a big part of what draws people to EDH. Um, in a lot of ways, it draws a lot of people to CDH too. You know, just have your own deck that does all of your own stuff. It's really cool, really fun. 
I love it. It's something you have to watch out for in CDH. Um, if you bring in too many pet cards to a deck, um, if you're purposefully or incidentally removing a lot of what have been long-established CDH staples from your deck without good reason, just because you like don't like them or whatever, um, if you are trying to bring over a lot of uh, EDH staples uh, that maybe don't cross uh, the river, so to speak, um, you know that's that is is in its own way kind of a casual mindset that you may be best to leave behind. True, very very true. So. There's nothing wrong with adding some pet cards to your deck because we absolutely do associate our identities to our commander decks. I don't care what anybody says. That happens in casual commander. It happens in CDH. It happens everywhere. People will actually race to get their deck onto the deck list database so that they can claim that they're the author of that deck and they're the only one who owns the idea, which is false, by the way. That is not the case, but that is how hard and strong we hold our identities to commander and to our commander decks. And there's a lot of times when you will say, well, I really want to, I love this. I've always loved this card ever since I was a kid and I want to put it to this deck. And then I've always loved this card as a teenager. I want to put it into this deck. And before long, your deck doesn't function and you don't know why, because you have 10 dead cards over the course of a game because you ran too many pet cards and not enough cards that actually help you win the game. There's a thing called killing your darlings. It's a common term. I believe it's in writing, but I've used it many times. It's basically saying, I know how much you love that pet card, but does that card actually help with your strategy of your deck? And if that is the, if that is not the case, then yes, you absolutely do not uh, run it in your deck. One to two. That's okay. You know, 10% of the deck. Now you're talking about a completely different deck at this point. It's just not the same deck. Uh, you're just you're you're just trying to get too much into the casual mindset. And there's plenty of room in casual commander to, you know, let your identity flourish and let your personality come through. And CEDH is more about having a lot of fun with winning while showing your personality and stuff like that, but not through necessarily individual cards, but more on the, you know, maybe on the deck archetype, maybe slash commanders, maybe approach to play style. That's where your personality and your identity can be, can shine a little bit more in the CDH meta. Yes, certainly. I agree, Ryan. Now I'm going to move on to a little bit more of a miscellaneous stuff that we came up with here. Just stuff that doesn't really follow into a, fall into a specific category, but we thought we're definitely start worth stuff mentioning. And um, the number one thing I don't know if this is a mistake that new CDH players make. I think this is a mistake that all CDH players make, myself included. Um, bad mulligans. And what I mean by bad mulligans is pretty much two specific things. Um, in EDH, there is very much, you can very much be incentivized to just keep, you know, spells and lands type of hand. You know, this this hand has four actionable spells that I can cast eventually, and it has three lands. Cool. I'm set. Let's play Magic the Gathering. Um, Well-built CDH decks shouldn't just be keeping spells in lands' hands. You know, you want to be able to do something. You want to be impacting the game as soon as turn one, very often. Even if that's just like putting out a mana dork on turn one so you can cast a really powerful spell on turn two with your three or more total mana. You know, uh, and so you should be mulliganing to reflect that um the one thing that somebody said to me once upon a time uh about the london mulligan which is our current mulliganing system is you know it's just broken use it why look at seven cards when you could look at 28 cards and you get to keep five of them <laughs> yes you know why why would you just look at that first seven and be like eh, this is fine i can keep it when you could look at another seven and then you can look at another seven and keep six of them. And you look at another seven and keep five of them. That's ridiculously powerful, especially with how high, like the good card density is in most CDH decks. Look at more of your cards. They're all good cards. Look at more of them. Don't just keep a lands and spells hand because it's there in front of you. I can't tell you the amount of times that I have heard. Well, I don't want to go to five, and this, I, I we're going I, to four, I, baby. Woo! Yeah. Oh, I don't want to go to five, and they keep a hand, and they just lose the game because they didn't have anything to play until turn three. 
because they wanted to keep six cards over five. That what and and so that's the thing. It just feels so bad to to say I only get to keep five. Oh, I only get to keep four. And you absolutely, if you ever say this hand isn't the fastest hand, stop thinking right there and ship it away. Stop! Don't keep that hand. It's like with how good so many of the cards are, a good five is infinitely better than a medium seven. <laughs> Yes, a mediocre, uh, a great five is so much better than a mediocre six. And I'll agree that there are some decks that don't mulligan super well. You can't go to four and three very well in every deck. Uh, but there are, are that those decks are actually not that many. Because the moment that you're at least red or at least blue, you usually can start to mulligan for a wheel effect. So that in and of itself allows you just, and that card alone allows you to get so much more aggressive with your mulligans. That one or two card addition that you add to a deck allows your decks to mulligan so much better, and you should mulligan. Now, there's so much to be said about mulliganing inside, you know, according to, you know, pod composition and seed order, and that's not necessarily a new CDH player. We can do an entire... See, deep dive episode on that one for sure we can and we won't on this one but just don't bring the casual mindset of well i've got lands and spells let's let's jam it no you want to say what is my game plan does this get me there or am i just playing land pass for three turns and losing the game do not do that use that london mulligan like you said cal it is such a broken mechanic it's such a broken thing that you can absolutely exploit it to its fullest potential. And as a quick example, the reason that there's people out there who just seem to win a ton of games, pay attention to how often they mulligan. And I'll bet you there is a correlation between their aggress how aggressive they mulligan and how often they win. Because they do not keep mediocre hands because they're seven cards. They keep great hands that are five and four cards and that gives them a better chance of winning before the game has even started. I totally agree, Ryan. And speaking of mistakes you can make before the game has totally even started, CDH cards are not cheap. Um, CDH cards are not cheap. We play a lot of staples. There's a lot of reserve list stuff that we mess around with. You know, Mox Diamond is kind of an auto-include. That card's like 500 bucks. And that's not even like the dual lands that every deck like has to play, you know? Um, and I think a lot of people can find a new deck and immediately say, all right, I'm going to play this deck. And then they go out and they spend, you know, even if you're just like buying staples that aren't reserve lists and stuff that you don't have for a deck, you can be like, all right, I need, I'm going to buy this Vampiric Tutor and I'm going to buy this $5 card. I'm going to buy this $10 card. I'm going to buy this $15 card. That adds up. And then you put the deck together and you don't like it. Yep. Don't spend a ton of new money on a new deck in the most playtest card friendly community on the planet. Yes, we are 100% playtest and proxy card friendly. Do not go and spend five, six, seven hundred dollars on a lion's eye diamond or a mox diamond or a mana crypt. An invention mana crypt, maybe is that much, but <laughs> uh, that's like a thousand dollars, Ryan. You're oh, bad, way off, no matter what mana crypt. You're <laughs> yeah, so I was I was wrong on both ends of that spectrum. But don't I see this online all the time? If you ever browse the competitive CDH subreddit or anything, you frequently get the thread that says, "Looking to get into CDH, which card should I buy first, Mox Diamond or LED?" And it's like neither. Do not buy either of those right now. Go and find a deck that you want to play and that you enjoy playing. There's a really good chance that the Mox Diamond will be in there, but the Mox Diamond is not the difference between you winning and losing every game. Getting better at the game is the difference between you losing or winning a game, not whether or not there is a zero-cost mana rock in it. That is not the difference. And that just goes back into what we said, which is, oh, well, I have all the expensive, you know, mana, fast mana, and I have all the expensive you know, free interaction, my deck is CEDH because everyone associates CDH from the outside looking in as a, a list of cards or a database of decks. And CDH is so much more than that. So do not buy those things until you've satisfied at least two requirements. Well, three requirements. First, 
whether or not CDH is even for you. CDH isn't for everybody, and that's okay. There's nothing that says that you have to like every single format in Magic. I don't like every format in Magic. That doesn't mean that that doesn't there's mean a, anything. There's a reason so, you play a lot of CDH and not much normal EDH. It's yes, you don't like exactly. normal EDH that much. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of casual EDH, and that's okay. I, I I don't really like to draft. I'm not very good at it, you know. And you know, sixty card formats aren't you know. I mean, they're okay, but they're not something I seek out. That but you know, and so CDH isn't for everyone. It's perfectly okay to not like CDH. But if you just spent two grand and realized you didn't like it. That's exceptionally bad. That that's exceptionally bad. For if you're you, able to turn around and it's sell those cards easily, you've probably lost like thirty percent of your money. Pretty pretty expensive mistake. Exactly. That's a huge expensive mistake. The second one, that deck that you're building might not be the deck for you. It might not even be the archetype for you. You might really think that Yuriko is the good way to get into CDH, but then you realize that you really hate Yuriko. You don't like what it does. You don't like the attacking and the combat step stuff. And that's just not your your style, you know? And so you spend a ton of money on Yuriko stuff and whoops, that didn't really work out for me. And then the third thing is, is that you're spending money because you think you should have these when in fact you, there's, a, there's plenty of people who play CDH every day that will never own a Mox Diamond, that will never own an LED because it's perfectly okay and it's perfectly acceptable to use playtest cards and proxy cards to play this game. We as CDH players know that this game is insanely expensive. And we know that by saying, well, you, you have to play with real cards. We're just basically saying that this is an exclusive club. We want to play with your wallet. We don't care about player skill. We only want to create this gated community that has completely limited growth, only restricted by how much money you can make. And it's just the completely wrong philosophy, in my opinion. And that's why CDH players do not have that, by the way. We want to play with people, and we want this format to grow, to be as big as it can be, because we get to play with all kinds of people. And if we do that by restricting uh, the access by how much you can pay, we're going to just basically stifle its growth, and it's going to die off. Exactly. Like, don't feel bad about not owning CDH cards. Like, I get it. I'm a card collector. I like owning my cards, but I own my team or pirate cards i like in most of the most expensive cards in that deck i pretty much only own because i bought them in 2015 or 2016 before they all got really pricey mm -hmm. i wouldn't buy a mox diamond now you know i would be very hard pressed to buy a volcanic island right now actually i don't own a volcanic island i don't I, i'm not gonna own a gaia's cradle i'm not gonna own a time twister i don't own an led i'm not gonna own an led it's just too pricey as much as I like owning cards, I'm not going to own those cards. And I'm part of a CDH channel. I talk on a CDH podcast every week. You don't, you don't, I, I don't own the cards. You don't need to own the cards. Uh, and really let that sink in. I think that is really the key. You, part of playing with power, who lives and breathes CEDH, doesn't own a Gaius Cradle, doesn't own a Volcanic Island. The access to these cards is not entry into this format. You are welcome to come in. So long as you can put together 100 cards and play at the table, that's what we care about. We don't care about whether or not your Gaia's Cradle is real or not. We've never cared about that. And I'll give you a compliment if it's a foil one, though. Uh, big true. Big true. Th those are nice. They're very, very, very nice. I own a Gaia's Cradle, but that's because I opened a Gaia's Cradle when it was $3.99 a pack. <laughs> okay, <laughs> old I'm, man. Because I'm so okay, old. Okay, old man. <laughs> And so it's not it's not one for one. If you started playing in Ixalan, you know, or whatever, you just you didn't have access to that stuff. Ixalan was four years ago, dude. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I hear people that say that they're coming into CEDH from Baldur's Gate. For those who are listening way in the future, that, that was in 2022. <laughs> so, but yeah, so understand that this is not money is not the barrier here. Please do not let money be the barrier. Please do not make the mistake of spending a ton of money on a new deck. Try them out. Try multiple out and see which ones fit you. See if the format fits you and see if this is something that you actually want to invest in. And then by all means, go do it. <laughs> because the other side of CDH is that we really like to bling our decks. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, big time. We love this format and we invest heavily into it. 
once we figured it out, not yep. beforehand. Yep, I have a ton of proxy decks. I've only gone through the effort of making one real because I like Teamer Pirates so much that I shell out some money on it. And that's okay because I have the expendable income to do it. Don't feel pressure to bling out your decks. It's just fun if you can. Yeah. But, um, you know, we're running a little short on time here, Ryan. So I'm going to skip exactly one point all the way to what I think is like the biggest mistake that a CEDH player can make. Uh, we, we, we have gone through all of this. And this is a, a, a shockingly easy thing, a mistake to make, which I've made a lot. And we've, we've spent almost an hour now talking about how complicated CEDH can be, how many options you have, um, you know, uh, how complicated a table can be how hard it can be to have the right attitude and stuff. And you know what? The worst mistake of all of these things that you can do is not asking other people for help. Um, there are a lot of very passionate CDH players who have all of this information all up in their brain and they would love to share it with you. It's like I said, uh, you're not going to be able to figure out some of this stuff on your own. It, it, you can learn it through experience, like through the hard knocks, or you can talk to people about it. You can ask people what they think about such and such a card and such and such a deck. You can ask people why we play Mox Diamond. Like, what? why are we playing a, an artifact where we just have to get rid of a land to get mana? You know, why are we doing that? You can ask people the questions you have. If, But if you don't ask people and are just like stumbling around blindly on your own, you can waste a lot of your time. You can have a lot of field bads and stuff that you can avoid if you had just asked other people for help. I think a lot of people that leave CDH with a bad taste in their mouth and they say this was a horrible format was because they didn't ask for help. Um, and every single thing that we said so far could be boiled down to if you just ask somebody for help for this, you'll help circumvent that. You know, oh, I'm recognizing a sign or whatever. Hey, I'm having trouble with my mulligans. Ask people for help. Ask the table. It's casual. I mean, I know it's not casual commander in that sense, but we're not playing tournaments. You know, we're not we're not playing for money. We're just playing commander. We're just playing it really powerfully. And so you say, you know, I'm not sure if I whether or not I want to keep this. Can you guys see whether or not I should have kept this? Ask your table. They're like, oh, yeah, uh, you could have done this and this and this. Or no, no, you definitely should ship that back. Or even something like, hey, I want to know how this combo works. I have a uh, sorts of plowshares in my hand. Can I stop this or when should I? And the rest of the table can say, my God, don't let him go to combat with Glenhorn Buccaneer. You'll lose the game. <laughs> See, if you had done, if I had asked for help, that wouldn't have happened. Asking for help is the most important thing. Most CDH players are happy to help you with any questions you have, no matter what they are, whether it be pet cards, strategies, you know, uh, Purchasing advice, London Mulligan, seat position, I, we, every single thing that we mentioned and more, people are always willing to help you. You can find help online. You can find help in Discord. You can find help everywhere. Please, please, please ask for help. You will make your life so much easier if you do. I fully agree, Ryan. And I think that about finishes up the time we have today for the Playing With Power podcast. And, you know, as after you've listened to this episode, you know, if if you're an invested player, uh, what are some mistakes that you made as a as a newer CDH player? How can you help people to avoid those mistakes yourself? Um, have you made some of these? Um, you know, have you made some of these mistakes yourself? Are you a new CDH player and uh, you were enlightened by this information? Think about it. Um, do you think there's mistakes we've missed? I'm sure you can let us know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so make sure to give us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast aggregator. You'd be surprised at how much it helps us. Uh, you can also find us on the Twitters, the Facebooks, the TikToks, the Instagrams, and much, much more. All links are in the episode description slash notes. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of the podcast. Tune in next time when we talk more about our favorite format in our favorite game, Magic the Gathering. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and we will see you next time.